Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're having a good time with Nana and Grandpa. I had fun talking to you on the phone. You guys sounded pretty silly though. Silly boys making silly noises. Blah, 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 blah. I miss you guys a lot. I just took a shower because I went for a run. And when I was on my run, I went through a little place called a like a wildlife, wildlife reserve. So it's a whole big field with lots of wildflowers. And I learned about a flower called the prairie, the prairie cornflower. And what it looks like, it looks kind of like a sunflower that got all droopy. So it has a brown little center. And then it has like five or six yellow petals that hang straight down instead of out. It's kind of funny. Maybe a Nana or Grandpa could look it up for you so you can see a picture. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Where do we leave off? Okay. Oh yeah, they, they were just coming out of the memory. Dumbledore got Harry out of the uh, memory that they were watching. Professor, Harry gasped. I know I shouldn't have. I, I didn't mean the cabinet door was sort of open and... I quite understand, said Dumbledore. He lifted the basin, carried it over to his desk, and placed it upon the polished top, and sat down in the chair behind it. He motioned for Harry to sit down opposite him. Harry did so, staring at the stone basin. The contents had returned to their original silvery white state, swirling and rippling beneath his gaze. What is it? Harry asked shakily. This? It is called a pensieve, said Dumbledore. I sometimes find, and I am sure you know the feeling, that I simply have too many thoughts and memories crammed into my mind. Uh, said Harry, who couldn't truthfully say that he had ever felt anything of the sort. At these times, said Dumbledore, indicating the stone basin, I use the pensieve. One simply siphons the excess thoughts from one's mind, pours them into the basin, and examines them at one's leisure. It becomes easier to spot patterns and links, you understand, when they are in this form. You mean, that stuff's your thoughts? Harry said, staring at the swirling white substance in the basin. Certainly, said Dumbledore. Let me show you. Dumbledore drew his wand out of the inside of his robes and placed the tip into his own silvery hair near his temple. When he took the wand away, hair seemed to be clinging to it. But then Harry saw that it was in fact a glittering strand of the same strange silvery white substance that filled the pensive. Dumbledore added this fresh thought to the basin, and Harry, astonished, saw his own face swimming around the surface of the bowl. Dumbledore, Dumbledore placed his long hands on either side of the pensive and swirled it, rather as a gold prospector would pan for fragments of gold. And Harry saw his own face change smoothly into Snape's, who opened his mouth and spoke to the ceiling, his voice echoing slightly. It's coming back. Kakarov's too. Stronger and clearer than ever. A connection I would have made without assistance, Dumbledore sighed, but never mind. He peered over the top half of his, the top of his half-moon spectacles at Harry, who was gaping at Snape's face, which was continuing to swirl around the bowl. I was using the pensive when Mr. Fudge arrived for our meeting and put it away rather hastily. Undoubtedly, I did not fasten the cabinet door properly. Naturally, it would have attracted your attention. I'm sorry, Harry mumbled. Dumbledore shook his head. Curiosity is not a sin, he said, but we should exercise caution with our curiosity. Yes, indeed. Frowning slightly, he prodded the thoughts within the basin with the tip of his wand. Instantly, a figure rose out of it, a plump, scowling girl of about sixteen, who began to revolve slowly with her feet still in the basin. She took no notice of whatsoever of Harry or Professor Dumbledore. When she spoke, her voice, her voice echoed as Snape's had done, as though it were coming from the depths of the stone basin. He put a hex on me, Professor Dumbledore, and I was only teasing him, sir. I only said I'd seen him kissing Florence behind the greenhouses last Thursday. But why, Bertha said, said, but why, Bertha, said Dumbledore sadly, looking up at the now silently revolving girl. Why did you have to follow him in the first place? Bertha? Harry whispered, looking up at her. Is that... was that Bertha Jorkins? Yes, said Dumbledore, prodding the thoughts in the basin again. Bertha sank back into them, and they became silvery and opaque once more. That was Bertha as I remember her at school. The silvery light from the pensive illuminated Dumbledore's face, and it struck Harry suddenly how very old he was looking. He knew, of course, that Dumbledore was getting on in years, but somehow he had never really thought of Dumbledore as an old man. 
So, Harry, said Dumbledore quietly, before you got lost in my thoughts, you wanted to tell me something? Yes, said Harry. Uh, Professor, I, I was in divination just now, and I uh, fell asleep. He hesitated here, wondering if a reprimand was coming, but Dumbledore merely said, Quite understandable. Continue. Well, I had a dream, said Harry, a dream about Lord Voldemort. He was torturing Wormtail. Y you know who Wormtail. I do know, said Dumbledore promptly. Please continue. Voldemort got a letter from an owl. He said something like Wormtail's blunder had been repaired. He said someone was dead. Then he said Wormtail wouldn't be fed to the snake. There was a snake beside his chair. He said, he said he'd be feeding me to it instead. Then he did the Cruciatus curse on Wormtail. And my scar hurt, Derry said. It woke me up. It hurt so badly. Dumbledore merely looked at him. Uh, that's all, said Harry. I see, said Dumbledore. I see. Now, has your scar hurt at any other time this year, excepting the time it woke you up over the summer? No, I... How did you know it woke me up over the summer? You are not Sirius's only correspondent, said Dumbledore. I have also been in contact with him ever since he left Hogwarts last year. It was I who suggested the mountainside cave as the safest place for him to stay. Dumbledore got up and began walking up and down behind the desk. Every now and then, he placed his wand tip to his temple, removed another shining silver thought, and added it to the pensive. The thoughts inside began to swirl so fast that Harry couldn't make out anything clearly. It was merely a blue blur of color. Professor, he said quietly, after a couple of minutes. Dumbledore stopped pacing and looked at Harry. My apologies, he said quietly. He sat back down at his desk. Do you... Do you know why my scar is hurting me? Dumbledore looked very intently at Harry for a moment, and then said, I have a theory, no more than that. It is my belief that your scar hurts both when Lord Voldemort is near you and when he is feeling a particularly strong surge of hatred. But why? Because you and he are connected by the curse that failed, said Dumbledore. That is no ordinary scar. So you think... That dream? Did it really happen? It is possible, said Dumbledore. I would say probable. Harry, did you see Voldemort? No, said Harry, just the back of his chair. But there wouldn't have been anything to see, would there? I mean, he hasn't got a body, has he? But, but then how could he have held the wand? Harry said slowly. How indeed, muttered Dumbledore. How indeed. Neither Dumbledore nor Harry spoke for a while. Dumbledore was gazing across the room, and every now and then, placing his wand tip to his temple and adding another shining silver thought to the seething mass within the pensive. Professor, Harry said at last, do you think he's getting stronger? Voldemort, said Dumbledore, looking at Harry over the pensive. It was the characteristic piercing look Dumbledore had given him on other occasions, and always made Harry feel as though Harry Dumbledore was seeing right through him in a way that even Moody's magical eye could not. Once again, Harry, I can only give you my suspicions. Dumbledore sighed again, and he looked older and wearier than ever. The years of Voldemort's ascent to power, he said, were marked with disappearances. Bertha Jorkins has vanished without a trace in the place where Lord Voldemort was certainly known to be last. Mr. Crouch, too, has disappeared, within these very grounds. And there was a third disappearance, one which the Ministry, I regret to say, do not consider of any importance, for it concerns a muggle. His name was Frank Bryce. He lived in the village where Voldemort's father grew up, and he has not been seen since last August. You see, I read the Muggle newspapers, unlike most of my ministry friends. Dumbledore looked very seriously at Harry. These disappearances seem to me to be linked. The ministry disagrees, as you may have heard while waiting outside my office. Harry nodded. Silence fell between them again. Dumbledore extracting thoughts every now and then. Harry felt as though he ought to go, but his curiosity held him in his chair. Professor? Yes, Harry. Uh, could I ask you about that court thing I was in, in the pensive? You could. I attended it many times, but some trials come back to me more clearly than others. Particularly now. Particularly now. You know, you know the trial you found me in? The one with Crouch's son? Well, were they talking about Neville's parents? Dumbledore gave Harry a very sharp look. Has Neville never told you why he has been brought up by his grandmother? Harry shook his head, wondering as he did so how he could have failed to ask Neville this in almost four years of knowing him. 
Yes, they were talking about Neville's parents, said Dumbledore. His father, Frank, was an R, just like Professor Moody. He and his wife were tortured for information about Voldemort's whereabouts after he lost his powers, as you heard. So they're dead? said Harry quietly. No, said Dumbledore, his voice full of a bitterness Harry had never heard there before. They are insane. They are both in St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. I believe Neville visits them with his grandmother during the holidays. They do not recognize him. Harry sat there, horror-struck. He had never known, never in four years bothered to find out. The Longbottoms were very popular, said Dumbledore. The attacks on them came after Voldemort's fall from power, just when everyone thought they were safe. Those at attacks caused a wave of fury such as I have never known. The Ministry was under great pressure to catch those who had done it. Unfortunately, the Longbottom's evidence was, given their condition, none too reliable. Then Mr. Crouch's son might not have been involved? Dumbledore shook his head. As to that, I have no idea. Harry sat in silence once more, watching the contents of the pensive swirl. There were two more questions he was burning to ask, but they concerned the guilt of living people. Uh, he said, Mr. Bagman... Has never been accused of any dark activity since, said Dumbledore calmly. Right, said Harry, hastily staring at the contents of the pensive again, which were swirling more slowly now that Dumbledore had stopped adding thoughts. And, uh, but the pensive seemed to be asking his question for him. Snape's face was swimming on the surface again. Dumbledore glanced down at it, into it, and then up at Harry. No more has Professor Snape, he said. Harry looked into Dumbledore's light blue eyes, and the thing he really wanted to know spilled out of his mouth before he could stop it. What made you think you'd really stop supporting Voldemort, Professor? Dumbledore held Harry's gaze for a few seconds, and then said, That, Harry, is a matter between Professor Snape and myself. Harry knew that the interview was over. Dumbledore did not look angry, yet there was a finality in his tone that told Harry it was time to go. He stood up, and so, so did Vold Dumbledore. Harry, he said as Harry reached the door, please do not speak about Neville's parents to anybody else. He has the right to let people know when he is ready. Yes, Professor, said Harry, turning to go. And, Harry looked back. Dumbledore was standing over the pensive, his face lit from beneath it by its silvery spots of light, looking older than ever. He stared at Harry for a moment, and then said, Good luck with the third task. And that's the next chapter. Chapter 31. The third task. Look at that thing. That's a sphinx. Okay, I love you guys very much. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.